Franz Kafka, the neighbor. My business rests entirely on my shoulders. Two young ladies with typewriters and business books in the anteroom, my room with a desk, cash register, consulting table, club chair, and telephone, that's my entire apparatus. So simple to oversee, so easy to manage. I am quite young, and the business rolls ahead of me. I don't complain, I don't complain. Since New Year, a young man has rented the small, vacant apartment next door, which I foolishly hesitated too long to rent. Also a room with an anteroom, but he also has a kitchen. A room and anteroom I could have probably used. My two ladies sometimes felt overloaded, but what would I have done with a kitchen? This petty consideration was to blame for letting the apartment slip through my fingers. Now this young man sits there. His name is Harris. What he actually does there, I don't know. On the door, it says, more than Harris, office less than. I have made inquiries. I was told it's a business similar to mine. Before granting credit, one cannot exactly warn against it, as it is about a young, aspiring man whose matter might have a future, but one cannot exactly recommend credit either, as apparently there is no fortune present at the moment. The usual information that is given when one knows nothing. Sometimes I meet Harris on the stairs. He always seems to be in a great hurry. He virtually scurries past me. I haven't really seen him properly. He already has the office key prepared in his hand. In a moment, he has the door open. Like the tail of a rat, he's slipped inside, and I stand again in front of the sign more than Harris, office less than, which I have read much more often than it deserves. The miserably thin walls that betray the honest working man but cover for the dishonest one. My telephone is attached to the wall of my room that separates me from my neighbor but I only mention this as a particularly ironic fact. Even if it hung on the opposite wall, everything in the neighboring apartment would be heard. I have only learned to mention the names of clients on the phone. But it doesn't take much cunning to guess the names from characteristic but unavoidable turns in the conversation. Sometimes, spurred by restlessness, I dance around the apparatus on tiptoes with the receiver at my ear, and yet I cannot prevent secrets from being revealed. Naturally, this makes my business decisions uncertain, my voice trembly. What does Harris do while I'm on the phone? If I wanted to exaggerate greatly, but often one must do that to gain clarity, I could say, Harris doesn't need a telephone, he uses mine, he has moved his couch to the wall and listens. I, on the other hand, must run to the phone when it rings, take the customer's wishes, make weighty decisions, execute large-scale persuasions. But above all, during the whole process, I unwittingly report to Harris through the wall. Maybe he doesn't even wait for the end of the conversation, but gets up after the part of the conversation that has sufficiently informed him about the case, scurries, as is his habit, through the city and, before I have hung up the receiver, he is perhaps already at it, working against me.